Welcome, welcome, welcome to a brand new episode of I Dang Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Sarfamenta. If this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, we welcome you. And if you are a returning audience member, we welcome you back for a brand new and special episode, or should I say a special inauguration day episode. So uh, as everybody knows throughout the world, today has been an historic day where we've seen just black woman excellence all around. And it's only fitting to have black excellence on tonight's episode. We have here a phenomenal school leader, an award-winning educator, global teacher prize finalist, TED speaker. I mean, I can go on and on about the resume, best-selling author, and now a unapologetic self-care advocate. So we're going to get into everything from educational leadership to teacher self-care and who else to reach this issue than none other than the one and only Dr. Nadia Lopez. So we're going to bring her on. Hello, hello. Hi, how are you? I mean, you appreciate that you are excited, but like, how are you really, really feeling in this moment, especially being on the continent of Africa as this is all unfolding? Um, It's surreal because, I mean, for somebody who has been born since the Reagan administration, mm -hmm. um, I never thought that this day would come, at least in my lifetime. So to finally be able to witness everything from, you know, just seeing the the former first lady to now seeing the the new vice president, um, to seeing, you know, the young sister um, poet Amanda Gorman, just everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just something. It was a spectacle. I mean, there isn't enough words to describe what what transpired today but mm -hmm. how about you how about you what were your thoughts i mean um it was needed right it was something that i think with all that we went through the past four years what we've gone through as a result of the pandemic what we went through with the with the terror attack um at the capitol this was a fitting moment for us to feel a little vindicated. Like, you know, we've gone through so much and at the end of it all, it's always black people who rise. And, yes. and you know, to see um, the Obamas, how they came through, like as always presidential, just setting the scene, <laughs> it was just awesome. Um, to see Vice President Harris stand with her husband, but you know, Justice Santa Mayor and do and, and, and be sworn in um in her purple, just just commanding all of the attention and 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 showing like the change of guard. Um and then to see, you know, President Biden, it was just like, oh, finally, you know, not to say that we are out of the woods and everything will be perfect, but you know, sometimes we just need a small victory. And as you stated, Amanda's poem was everything. It just, it lifted up our spirits. Her five minutes of reciting that poem just was reminiscent of when Maya Angelou did it for Barack Obama's inauguration and yeah. how we all hung on to every single one of her words. Um, you know, black girl magic, as per usual, <laughs> was in the house. So I was excited. I was excited. All right. And as you mentioned, um, that's not to say that our work is done. Mm -hmm. But we also have to remember, especially today, that this is a day of celebration. And as part of our resistance, mm -hmm. joy has to be an important component of that. Mm -hmm. And so... I mean, this is why we just have to, you know, just sit back and really process what we just witnessed. Yep. Just everything. 
But um, I do want to shift gears and celebrate you because you are doing some phenomenal things. You've been doing phenomenal things, but uh, what you're doing um, in the area of just self-care, which is something that we all need as educators, is something mm -hmm. that needs to be um, discussed mm -hmm. in major detail. We're going to really get into that uh, today. But before we do, I mean, I know your story because I've, I've read your book, but mm. for our viewers who haven't had a chance to really get to know you and and just what led you into education, if you could just share with us what brought you into this profession and, and just your upbringing overall. Mm -hmm. So my parents are not from this country. My mom is from Guatemala. My dad is from Honduras. So I start off by sharing that because they weren't rich. Um, their only way of sharing wealth with me was through education. They felt that as long as I got a solid foundation um, in education, I could basically get opportunities that would allow me to be successful. And so they trusted the public school system. I first started out, let me just say this. I first started out in um, a very Afrocentric school called Al Karim. Mm -hmm. um, and that was actually created by Sister Aura, who was Assemblyman Karim Kamara's mother, who was in New York State, um, because she wanted children of color to be immersed in who they were or who they are based off of our history and being able to um, really know our lineage. And, and through that, I went to school two to about six, I want to say. Um, and it wasn't preschool. It was school, school. I had uniform. I had books. I had to write. They were very much believers that children can learn at an early age. And so that set the foundation for when I went into public school, um, where my mother was very intentional about finding the right school. Um, and she wasn't going to let me go to the zone school. She got a lease at someone ha someone's house who was across the street from a better school that was literally three blocks away from where we live. But mm -hmm. because of the, the zoning, right. um, I couldn't go to, I couldn't, I wasn't assigned to that school. So she did what she needed to. Um, I ended up going to that school, which led me to a gifted school when I was in junior high school. And then one of the best high schools in New York City, a Philip Randolph High School, um, and then going on to college. So fast forward, I have my own child and I start thinking about, well, who's going to be her teacher? And from what I heard from many of my colleagues was that the school system was like terrible and, and you know, teachers are constantly changing. And I just couldn't understand that because I, I I was a proud product of public school. So ultimately I decided that I wanted to go into education. I wanted to become a teacher um, because there were so many phenomenal administrators um, as well as those who were in the classroom who really had influence over my life. And so I ended up going through the New York City Teaching Fellows and, um, and then became a teacher. And then once I got in there, <laughs> I recognize, oh, there's some things that aren't right about our system. And it started with us as the adults and things that we allowed. Um, and that kind of led me into leadership because I felt like leaders set the tone. They create the culture. Um, they're the ones who maintain the expectations of what their staff does, as well as what the children will be learning. And so that's what landed me in um, opening up Mount Hopper's Academy. Wow. And, and you mentioned just leadership, just mm -hmm. you wanting to get into leadership. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to know from you, what is the journey like mm -hmm. being, you know, Afro-Latina woman, mm -hmm. you know, with educational leadership? Because I think it's important for us to point out just the ups and downs that come with having that identity mm -hmm. and navigating through those rigors and challenges that, that come with leadership, regardless of what your racial and cultural background is, because just being a school leader is, is difficult by itself. Well, you know, um, we're not the majority, right. you know, in terms of the numbers, the stats. So I'll say this, in New York City, there, there seems to be a higher percentage of 
um, black and brown people who hold positions in schools, whether it's as educators, teachers, guidance counselors, and school leaders. Um, but the, the higher you get up the ladder, the more challenges come. Mm -hmm. And they actually come from people who look like us, right? right? So, you know, I had to deal with teachers who, younger, who just get into the system, who may have two or three years in, and they just think that they should become an assistant principal or principal, and they know every single thing. And it's just like, you don't, you don't know half of the stuff that, <laughs> that is required to manage a school. Um, or you have to deal with the misogyny that comes with the fact that it's a male dominated space. Right. Um, and as a black woman to be try, you know, you're trying to navigate and get things done for your children and people are calling you sweetheart or, you know, they're, they're, they're just assuming that you're helpless and somehow they're saving you. And it's just like, you know, you have to check folks, but you got to check them respectfully because people get in their feelings <laughs> and they hold resentment and they may be the gatekeepers of the things that you need done. Um, and then there's also sometimes the competitiveness that happens, right? Like, unfortunately, in education, the higher we get, we're almost taught or we're trained to compete against each other or to right. compare ourselves to each other. And so there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, and so it's hard, it, it can become hard. Um, but what I did is actually, I grounded my work in the children. So my school was a co-located co school because we um, shared space with two other schools because the way New York City is set up, they'll, they, if your schools are have space within them, they literally will move a school in. So we had three schools on our campus and um, that's the norm. And so I was on the third floor. I was all about my scholars. I was about my scholars. I was about my team. I was about the community of Brownsville. I was about my parents. I didn't entertain conversations about anything else. I didn't want to know what anybody else was doing in their school. I just wanted to make sure that my kids had everything that they need, that they knew every single day that they were dope and they were important to me. My staff knew that they had someone who was going to rally for them um, and I was going to fight the good fight. And my parents knew that I was no nonsense. And so I didn't have time to worry about anything else. You know, and it's like that quote that says, you know, small minds are kind of like worried about people and, and people who um, I'm, I'm butchering the quote, but it's just kind of like you got to be about the work and you got to yes. be focused about what you want to do. Cause if not, you're then focused on gossip and you're focused on everything else that's happening. That's irrelevant. And so I pride myself on knowing each and every one of my scholars. I pride myself on being available and receptive to the needs of my team and trying to always maintain an open door. Can't say that I was perfect, but I was willing to always say to my team, I'm not perfect, I wanna improve, how can I do that? Um, and because of that authenticity, I was able to build relationships, which oftentimes became conflicts because to everyone else who was outside of my world of Mount Hall Bridges, because it seemed impossible to do that, right? It seemed like, how does she have this relationship? Why are the kids saying all these things about her? But I'm like, I'm in service of. Right. You know, I'm here only to do this. I was very clear on my purpose. It wasn't about the check because you never get paid enough. It no. wasn't about the glory of the title because the title, you know, could be easily taken away. Once you get into administration, they can take the title away from you. So that wasn't what was keeping me there. It was literally to see the children succeed to get what they deserve and to prove everybody wrong like i lived and thrived off of that just i want to make sure that they knew these mm -hmm. children right here my kids oh they gonna they gonna get it no and as you were talking i just kept thinking about what uh former secretary of education john king said about the invisible tax mm -hmm. that's imposed on educators and mm -hmm. usually when we talk about this, we just talk about classroom teachers, but this also applies to administrators as well. Mm -hmm. And everything that you're describing is what he talks about. Just the fact that as black educators, we feel like we have to go above and beyond because 
we have to do that in order to um, compensate for what our students are not receiving through mm-hmm. the educational experience. So I want to know from you, because as I was reading your book, um, The Bridge of Brilliance, you talk about this in extensive detail and you're very transparent in mm-hmm. your description of how it was having to start my Hall Bridges Academy and then not to receive the funds from the Department of Ed that you're supposed to receive and mm-hmm. and all the other things that happen. So I think before you get into that, if you could just share what inspired you to write the book and then what are some of the messages that you hope that educators would receive from it? I wrote the book because our story wasn't being told. I didn't see anything on the bookshelves that was actually speaking about our experiences as educators, especially in communities like Brownsville, in real time. Right. It was, you either had books on pedagogy, right? Specific to pedagogy, you had books on um, discipline, you had books on, you know, what you need to say to teachers or, you know, like the, the, what's happening in the classrooms, what's happening in the lunchroom, the dynamics, but it wasn't like an actual principal who looked like me, who's dealing with the circumstances that I'm dealing with and just being authentic about it. Right. I didn't want to ground it in like, be super like focused on research. It's just like, I don't need to, I don't need to bog you down with research. I need you to just understand the real life experience of being in a school. And I wanted to get granular about the children and their stories because you never hear the stories of the children and how, you know, as an administrator, I have to navigate making sure I'm holding adults accountable, making sure that I'm present and I'm supporting them, Mm -hmm. but then still (laughs) ensuring that they know like, you can't speak to these children any which way, you can't think that they're not good enough, but then you can't think you're not good enough. So trying to even just explain how I have to navigate the complexities of a school building. And then still try to remain present as a principal while I'm battling my own health issues, while I'm battling inadequacies as a parent, while I'm trying to like, I'm trying to do all things. And so, you know, I think that oftentimes there is a need for folks to say, well, you know, they want the quick, quick, easy fix. And so what the book tells you is that you have to really be about the work in a way that you have to have passion about it. And, and, and I'm being real and honest about it. It's not easy and it's exhaustive. Yes. But at the end of the day, the bridge to brilliance is how we, the adults, um, were able to come together under this vision in order to make sure that these children from Brownsville could see their full potential and we love them through everything that they they are experiencing. Um, but we still have high expectations that they're gonna succeed. Right, and, and these are all things that are important, mm-hmm. but why is it that as educators, and I'm guilty of this too. Mm-hmm. I know when I first got into teaching over 10 years ago, I saw veteran teachers and colleagues around me working 60 plus hour weeks. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was the norm because that's what I saw around me. So then I thought, okay, I need to sacrifice my weekends to get these lesson plans done. And being a black male educator, that was an extra layer that I had to deal with in Mm -hmm. proving that I deserve to be in this space, but also that I'm committed to be in this space uh, Mm -hmm. for the children. So, I mean, why is it that when we talk about self-care, why is it that when we get the signals, all the signals in the world to just pause and take a break or to just drop everything, we continue to 
keep moving forward because it's, it's something that just sounds very common now. Like we just seem to keep on pushing, but you don't hear that in many other professions. Well, you know what? Here's the reality. Um, we've been taught that. Like we didn't, this just didn't start with us. We sure. have been taught this because we've, we've seen our parents do it. We've seen family members do it. And unfortunately, um, black people have, it's been ingrained in us that we, we have to work exceptionally harder than everybody else. And that we continuously keep pushing even when we are exhausted. And especially for black women, we're, we're taught to be super women, right? We're, we're like, we've experienced abandonment. We've experienced having to raise our families on our own. We've experienced, um, all of the things that reminds us that we're not adequate in terms of pay, mm -hmm. in terms of the levels of respect. Um, black males, you, you know, there is the, often the feeling of you're not good enough. You have to, uh, you're either seen as the enforcer, especially when you go into in schools, you're not given the support. As long as you have some disciplinary um, strengths, right? no one comes into your class. Like, you know, they just want you to keep the kids quiet and okay. And it's like, it's rare that someone goes into your classroom to really sit down, to really support you, to ask you what your needs are, talk about your goals, because there's just already an ideal, a stereotype of who you are in this world. And so I want us to understand you can't, don't be hard on yourself because of what we've been conditioned to do. If we all think about our parents and our grandparents and how they were raised and how they raised us, you know, you had to toughen up. You had to have work ethic. You had to show up early. You had to make sure your clothes was pressed a certain way. You had to have a certain diction. You had to, they taught you all of these things. We never had leeway for making mistakes. We never had leeway for um, trying to figure ourselves out because they knew the burden, the tax that comes with, if you're not on point, you're not going to keep that job. You're not going to get that yeah. job. All of these things. Right. Um, and so it's important that we recognize that and then ha we have to create our own boundaries. Even if the boundaries may force us not to get certain opportunities, but if you don't respect yourself, if you don't start speaking about what your needs are or start um, holding people accountable, like putting things in writing and asking the right questions, you will find yourself always trying to um comply right and we all know like you know we've been in the school buildings where everybody else is not working as hard as us <laughs> cuz they're Come on now they're not okay. working as hard as us and they don't have to work as hard as us right they can get away with all things but if you're really about this work you will find yourself working 10 times harder because at the end of the day you know what you're you know what you're pouring into and what the results will be. And so we do it from a place of love. We do it from a, an understanding of what our purpose is. Um, but again, you have to start naming those things. And I'm going to say this, it wasn't easy for me. It, you know, it required me to get to a place of once I resigned, I recognized like there was, there were times that I could have fought differently. There were people that I should have called on. Um, but because of the notoriety that came with Dr. Lopez, it mm -hmm. was like, how dare you even say that you can't manage this, right? Because you're Dr. Lopez. Even though before, like I, I've been saying it all the way it's through, but now it's the same person though. Right, but the fame, the fame will have people less receptive to helping you because right. part of it is that they feel threatened by the fame, but it's just like, I'm not tripping off of the fame. If whatever I'm receiving is actually giving my scholars access to things that they should have access to. And if it allows me to get into a room and be able to speak about what it's like to be an educator in communities of color where 
we are marginalized, where we are not seen as equal, where there's all these inequities, where there's a failure by the system to respect and respond to our needs, then I'm going to be the person who's going to do that. Um, and if they say, well, wh how can we help you? These are the things that I need. Well, are there other people that we could support? These are the people that you can support, or these are ways that you can show up to help other schools. I'm going to do that work. But oftentimes people see the threat of you are bigger, you are like you're you're famous, you're this and that. And I'm like, I still have to drive my car. <laughs> right. I still got to cook my food. I still got to pay my bills like no one else is doing these things. So you're tripping off of something that has nothing to do with you, but it's actually not providing me with anything else. Because if I'm as famous as you think I am, why would I stay here? Like it doesn't, it, you know, like it doesn't equate to what I have to get dragged through. Does not balance to what, you know, I want to actually accomplish here? So it's, it's a lot, but it's a it's a it's a balancing act that we are all trying to figure out. Right. And I think that's one of the fortunate things about social media and, and just this technology era in general, mm -hmm. you know, perception becomes reality. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't really know the true story behind what they see on the computer screen. Mm -hmm. And so they come up with these assumptions about how your life is and, and the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that you kept harping on was just this, was just the fact that as educators, we deal with so many inadequacies mm -hmm. because of the expectations that are placed upon us, mm -hmm. most of which are very unrealistic yeah. and unfair. Mm -hmm. But that's the written law. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about a couple of things. I think number one, you mentioned just the good and the bad about your time at My Hall Bridge Academy as far as just having to you know, navigate those different challenges. But was there a breaking point that just told you, you know what, it's time for me to walk away? Because just listening to you, there are times where if it was me, I probably would have walked away, but you just kept on going. But what mm -hmm. was like that breaking point for you that just told you, you know what, Man, I got to go. Like this, this is now way too much for me to handle. This is way beyond my threshold. <laughs> When the doctor said I had three options, I'll either have an early death because I was leading to that. Um, I would have to be on dialysis or have a kidney transplant um, because in May of 2019, I was diagnosed with um, autoimmune kidney disease, which was brought on by stress. And mm. so from May 29th all the way up until July 1st, I was on a leave of absence from the school. Um, and and at July 1st of 2020. So I was taking my time in terms of building my system back, taking all the therapeutic measures physically. Like it was so much. I had to go, I was on steroids. I had to take, go on physical I had to receive physical therapy because of the side effects of steroids. I had, I was like, um, when they weaned me off, like the side effects was, it was just terrible. And then, um, I had to get mental health support. Like I had to go to therapy. Thank God I found a really good therapist because I had to really work on a lot of the vicarious trauma that I had sustained doing the work. Um, because here's the thing, you know, when you deal in communities that are marginalized and poverty stricken, mm -hmm. you ultimately um, are absorbing everything that's happened. All of the traumas that they're experiencing, you're experiencing too. And then you have your own personal traumas, right? So of there are course. things that I didn't even realize that I was having to deal with and work out. So all of those complexities, I literally had to start meditation classes, go to yoga, um, change my diet. There were things that, you know, I was just getting by. I didn't eat properly because there was no real good food options in Brownsville. Um, 
I would take food to school, but because I was working nonstop, I wouldn't eat until six o'clock in the afternoon, right? While I was still at work, or sometimes I didn't even eat at all. And so that was my running routine. And I barely drank water. I would have tea in the morning or iced coffee. And then I would be like running through, not going to the bathroom, all the things that I would never allow my staff members to do. I was literally doing it to myself. And so, um, you know, I, God was like, she got to take a, she got to chill because she'll keep going. And so I took the step back, was working on myself. And then ultimately COVID happened. Yes. And, you know, um, I could have easily said, well, that's their business because I'm out here trying to get better. And but that's not you, though. No, that's not me. And the Department of Education had cut me off on top of that. Um, and when I say cut me off, they they stopped paying, stopped paying me. Um, so the only thing I had was my health benefits. And that was because I was covered under FMLA. And I didn't know that. I had no idea until I got sick. I had no idea that the way they set it up is that you have to exhaust all of your personal time before they even consider giving you time off. So because I never took days off, I literally had 156 of my own days that I had accrued and I had to exhaust all of that. So that's what gave me the seven months off. And then when my doctors was like, you need to get surgery and you need additional time out of work, and I requested a medical sabbatical, they were like, no. And I was like, what? And they said, well, you can have restoration of health, but we're not paying you. And so if I was selfish and if I was like other people that I know are in leadership, they would have been like, oh, well, the school will figure it out. But during COVID, people were so fearful as they should have been, right? There, was, there were teachers feeling sick and I had to like, again, I'm on leave. I had to like reach out and email and say, so there's someone who apparently is showing signs and symptoms of perhaps oh, COVID no. and what should we do? And they're like, we'll tell that person to stay home. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what about the school? Cause they could have exposed somebody in the school. Well, you know, tell them to stay home and we'll figure it out. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Because in another school, y'all would have closed the school down for at least 24 hours to figure it out. And so that was my immediate like, oh, y'all really, y'all not, y'all don't care, depending on the neighborhood. So um, I physically went into the school building because they made the announcement on a Sunday. They hadn't prepared, even though they should have prepared, but they really thought that we were going to be out for two weeks because that's the that's the mentality. Oh, you know, we'll put a couple of things online. Parents could follow up. And I was just like, they don't even understand the word pandemic. Like pandemic isn't flu for two weeks. It is straight. The whole world is affected. Right. Okay. So on the Monday when they told us no one can go into the school building because they were trying to figure things out, I asked the team to get together on the phone, our leadership team that was comprised of uh, teacher leads, um, the school-based support team. We got on a call. We must have been on a call for two and a half, three hours. We hashed out everything. We came up with a plan of action. Like, what do we have in place at the school? What do we need to make sure is functioning? How do we train those who may not have access to online or haven't been online in Google Classrooms? Who needs technology? What's going to be the plan B if people don't have, um, the kids don't have internet? We had the whole thing mapped out. So when we got into the school Tuesday, it was like sixth grade me with this group, seventh grade me with that group. And we worked like a well-oiled machine, right? And so we did that. And then every experience that we would have in the school, we transferred that online. And I was just like, okay, teachers need mental health support. Our mental health provider that we've had since 2010 when I opened up the school provided mental health support, not just for our team, but also our parents. We had mindfulness from another, org um, from another group of individuals. We had um, parent-teacher conference every other week. I was like, we can't wait for six weeks to find out if we're doing a good job or if parents need support. Every other week we met with the parents. It got to a point where I was like, teachers don't need to work on Mondays because nobody wants to wake up on Monday. If they choose to work and do instruction, that's fine. But in terms of work, they need to just check in with the scholars. They could watch a movie. And, and the staff like felt good, right? Because we were being responsive. And then on Fridays, I was like, nope, 
kids need to make up work. They need, they need, they could be online working on something that's challenging, do some review or turn in work that they have outstanding. But teachers need to just get together. They need to have team meetings. They could work individually on lesson plans. They can meet with us as administrators. But I was just thinking in real time. So you imagine I'm doing all of this. I'm supposed to be on leave. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do anymore. I'm not meditating. <laughs> I'm not drinking my water. I'm not eating meals. I'm literally right. being responsive every minute. And so it started to take its toll because I started to feel like the weight. And then so many people were passing away, especially in New York. So every single day was like I was getting a phone call of someone that I knew and they, you know, and, and, and all that stuff and then supporting friends and family through what they were going through. And so June came right before June, I want to say George Floyd was like the end of May. And, um, you know, we heard about Breonna Taylor. We heard about Amara Arbery. And I didn't really hear responsiveness from the Department of Education. And then George Floyd happens. And I was like, I was waiting for someone to say something. And there was no check-in. There was no, are you okay? There was no, as a system, we're gonna meet with the principals to really just find out how you're doing, what support you need for your school, nothing. Wow. I had to immediately plan with my team. I said, we cannot allow this to like be swept under the rug. So we literally um, came up with a plan of action that the teachers were going to have conversations with the scholars. Some of them watched the documentary, um, 19, I think it's 1993, whatever the one is about um, the uprising in LA so that the scholars could understand why people would riot. Right. Because we wanted to combat the narrative of what we knew at the time that the administrative, the president who was in office then and what media was saying about black people and us rioting. And so mm -hmm. we wanted to bring context to that. We had full day of conversation. We wanted people to unpack and the teachers themselves were having a hard time. So I had to recognize that we had a whole mental health day just for the staff so that they could unpack. We brought community activists into conversations with the staff a day after that to talk about, well, what can we do in order to understand how we, it's not just about saying defund the police, but what are we asking for? What do you need to see happen in the community? So that's intentional, right? That's, that's being intentional and that's giving more energy. And again, when your question is, what was the breaking point? It was all of these little things where you don't care about my health. You're right. not caring about the sanctity of my team. And then we have an issue with an uprising that's affecting so many. And we're in a community where one of our teacher's brothers was killed by the police the year before. Right. And we all were there to support her and had to go to his funeral service. So it's hitting us a different way. So as mm -hmm. a result of that, I was like. How, how do I, I love what I do. I love being able in this moment to care for my team, but the way I'm showing up and I happen to go and get my medical, my blood work done. That's when the doctor was like, so are you fasting? And I was like, I'm not fasting. He was like, so are you skipping meals? And I said, oh, you know what happens? I wake up in the morning, I get on Zooms and Google Classroom. I'm texting my team. He was like, okay, so Nadia, all the work that we did <laughs> to get you to a place of remission, you're literally about to relapse. Mm -hmm. And I thought about, I don't have no more days and they wasn't gonna pay me and I could barely like get this health restoration. So if I go back into the job, they're not even talking about what September is gonna look like. They're not even prepared for what's gonna happen with our scholars. They're going to say the school is responsible, which means the principal is responsible. And the doctor is literally telling me I'm going to relapse. Wow. What am I proving to my daughter? What am I proving to my staff? What am I even proving to God who placed me in this position? Right. I can't do it no more. Wow. I can't. And so because of that, I decided like I'm going to have to resign. Um, 
because they simply weren't going to be willing to change. And I, it was very clear that I was disposable. So, you know, when I, when I chose to leave, I didn't have a plan. I didn't have medical coverage. <laughs> I didn't have backup, nothing. I was just That was like, all given to us. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was just like, you know what? Um I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to allow God to tell me what my next steps are. And I was smart. I I like the house that I'm in now. I purchased my house when I was a teacher. So when folks are like, "Oh, I don't have enough money." If you say you don't have enough money, you're never going to have enough money. I bought this on a teacher's salary making peanuts literally mm -hmm. and because i did it when i didn't have a lot of money and i was smart about not buying beyond my means to impress anybody else i always said if god forbid i don't have a job i want to have a home that i don't have to worry about paying my mortgage and so i was able to maintain um having my home being able to pay my bills um because I was just being super frugal, right? I've I've driven the same car since 2007 and I'm not ashamed to say it because I was like, what I'm getting a new car for, right? Wait, pause, pause, Dr. Booker, <laughs> because I want people to hear this. Mm -hmm. See, all y'all talking about, you know, Dr. Lopez, global teacher, prize finalist, mm -hmm. big time. She just told y'all, she's been driving the same car for the past, what? Almost 14 years. I just want to highlight that part. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say that. I don't I don't live beyond my means, and you have to be clear on who you're living for. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a new car, fine, you know, spend. But my my belief has always been because I'm I'm just gonna share this. I remember when my parents separated, so it's it's trauma driven for me. When my parents separated when I was eleven. My mother had to pay bills for the first time. My dad paid all the bills. So my mother having to pay the bills, we went from having a lot to having nothing. I didn't know how much my mother made. I didn't know how much my father made, but collectively they lived well, right? But when my mom had to be on her own, she was a nurse's assistant. She was barely cracking $30,000, okay? Wow. So I don't even know how she was even maintaining herself at all. So the fact that we went from having a life of comfort to now we're getting food from the food pantry and now we're not having Tropicana, we having this concentrated, no frills, droop, like I, it's been traumatic to me. So growing up, I always said, I will never be in a place where my child has to endure not having. So I never live for everyone else because when you impress people, when something happens, those same people are not coming to your rescue. They're not coming to save you. So you can't pay my mortgage. You can't pay my car. No, like I own my car. I own my car. My insurance is quite low and I have full insurance because I own my car, right? My house, I pay, I pay close. I don't want to say close to nothing. I pay a low amount in terms of my mortgage because of the fact that I bought it in 2004, mm. right? So 2004, and I sat on it. I wasn't buying the eight family, the eight bedroom house for what I eight, I don't want eight people in my house like that, right? So I bought, it's myself and my daughter, and I know my mother would be either with me or coming to visit me. I need enough space for us, right? So that's what I bought. My house wow. got three floors. I have enough bedrooms for everybody. We live comfortable. I'm good. Like I don't have to what I don't I don't have people coming in and out of my house. Right? And so that's what I say about we don't have to live beyond our means. You don't have to be buying designer designer designer. You like it, that's cool. I once I became a, a principal I might have had a I'm not going to say I might have had I've had my Louis Vuitton, I had my Gucci, but guess what? I never took those things to school. I never did unless I had to go out in that evening because I never wanted my scholars to be so focused on the the name brand as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, the 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 work, the 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 intentionality of who I wanted them to be, 
right? And then I'm also at work until midnight. So am I setting myself up for somebody to be like, oh, shorty, you always got a Gucci bag. No, right. no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Uh-uh. Nope. I had my little nine West bag or something else and I was carrying and I was good with that. So, you know, I'm not saying that folks should not live comfortably as you shouldn't get the things that you want, but I like to travel. I like experiences. So if I'm going to drop a thousand dollars it's because I'm buying a plane ticket and I want hotel, right? I'm not mm -hmm. dropping a thousand dollars anymore on a pair of shoes because after I wear the shoes once, when am I going to wear them again? So we got to be smart and practical, especially when we're as educators and we're talking about we never make enough. Are you investing your money? Have you learned that game, right? Have you learned how to invest in stocks? Have you learned how to just take $20 or $50 out of your account and place it on an online bank account? Come so for now. the past 10 years, I've always had money set aside without touching it. So then you have a nest egg, right? But we'll say, I don't have enough money. But in this pandemic, you have you didn't have to go out and eat all the time, right? You didn't go out with your friends. You're not drinking at having brunch. You're not driving around. So did you decide that the money that you save on coffee, gas, hanging out with your friends, did you take that money and put it aside? Or were you on Amazon buying all the things for what? For what? Right. No. Nah. We have to be a year into this pandemic. Some people probably have a couple of thousands of dollars saved up while somebody's out here like, oh, I'm still broke and I want more money. We all want more money. And I get it. Every state is not paying well. But you also have to take accountability. You have to. And if you've ever been poor before, you know how to hustle. No, but you're right about everything. You're just driving game right now. You're driving game and free of charge, free 99. But what's what's amazing is this is not new. Mm -mm. This isn't new. We've always been broke as educators. Yeah. Right. You always. And, and here's the thing. If you think about the teachers who taught when I was a kid, they were making nothing. They would make they were cracking maybe 26, 27, the most thirty thousand dollars a year back in the 80s. You know what I'm saying? Like, so now when we get to this place of, you know, depending on what state you're in, if you're making 45,000, if you're making 60, right? New York, there are teachers with 20 years in making six figures. So don't get it twisted. They make money, but it's all about, okay, we understand the cost of living is high. We understand that, you know, people have responsibilities. Yes, they do. But you know what? There are people, you have to make a consorted effort in understanding your profession. When you got into the profession of teacher, you already knew you wasn't going to make a lot of money. Come on now. You knew that, right? Like you didn't you didn't walk in thinking like, oh, when I get in, they're gonna start paying a hundred grand. You already knew from years and years, decades of people saying teachers don't make enough. I am not saying you should be like, so Dr. Lopez, you say we should accept it. No, what I'm saying is you have to prepare yourself. I was working in corporate. So I want to be very clear. When I was working in corporate, when I left Verizon, I was making, and this is back in early 2000s, I was making $56,000 a year, right? That's answering not bad. The phone. No, answering the phone. I wasn't doing, I was just answering the phone. I was account collection wow. and I was answering the phone and I, and I worked, I became like a, a supervisor in the back dealing with like escalated calls and stuff like that, right? But still in all, First job out of college, by my second year of working at Verizon, I was already making fifty thousand. I worked there for four years. I'm up to fifty six thousand dollars. I get into education. I take a fifteen thousand dollars, fifteen to sixteen thousand dollar pay cut. I think my we started off at thirty nine, not something crazy. Wow. Why would I do like? 
When I was working at Verizon, I worked eight to four, but when I left at four o'clock, I didn't have to worry about anything. I didn't have to grade papers. I didn't have to speak to nobody. I didn't have to worry about if somebody's phone was off, who cared? I didn't have to bother, right? I go into a profession where I know the day is not going to end at three o'clock. I know I'm making less money, hmm. right? And I might not make extra because there's no overtime just given to you, right? Nope. It's not popping like that. And it takes years for you to keep moving up. I made that decision. So the minute I did that, I had to figure out, well, how are you going to live differently? You can't live like you worked at Verizon. And we used to get paid every single week. You hear me? So by the time I thought I was broke, I didn't have a check. Another check came in. So I, you know, every Thursday, boop, my money was in my bank account. Boop. Here I go becoming a teacher. Now I'm getting paid every other week. I can't splurge as much. So I had to change my way of living. I had to change my spending habits. I had to start tapping into my own gifts. Okay, so if I can't make money this way, how are you going to side hustle and make some extra money? Come on. I like yeah. poetry. So I was writing poems. I was creating gift baskets. If people need to help with like tutoring, I did that. I was a special ed teacher. I found out that there was a way for you to become um, work for the state and do evaluations for kids. They was paying seventy five to one hundred dollars an hour. There's all type of stuff that they don't tell us that exists. But there's things that's out there. I recognize I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. Oh, I'm going to start tapping into this. Right. No. Yeah. And so and that was the thing. And then I. I found out other teachers are making extra money by working after school and doing X, Y, and Z. I was like, oh, you know, I don't mind doing whatever, whatever. And at that time, because of uh, what was it, No Child Left Behind, there was a lot of tutoring. There was extra money that was being provided. So most people was like, I'm not staying. I'm, I'm you know, I'm already tired. No problem. I'm going to stay because I ain't got nothing else to do. Even though I have my daughter, she's in her school and her school ends at six o'clock because I had that type of uh, 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 she was also in an Afrocentric school. They started 7.30 to 6. I don't have to pick her up till 6 o'clock. So I'm going to work with my kids. I make extra money and I'm going to put that money aside. And I'm saying that because we will go into a profession, get mad at how much we pay, knowing how much it is, right? And then you're like, but we deserve more. Yes, you deserve more. You absolutely do. But I had to start putting my teachers on to how our budget even looks. So I'm going to say mm -hmm. this to folks. You got to start becoming part of the leadership team or develop relationships with the principals or the assistant principals who really understand your school's budget. OK, my school budget. Let me just say if it was like two point one million dollars, you'd be like, yo, you had two point one million dollars. At $2.1 million. That's on the low end, right? But then my teacher's salary and my uh, guidance counselor and secretary, every, all the staff, by the time you add it up, was $1.9 million. Mm. So I'm left with $200,000, okay? That's supposed to last me for a year. Wow. I'm supposed to buy technology. I'm supposed to get your professional development. I'm supposed to do after school programming. I'm supposed to do all this intervention. I'm supposed to get supplies. I'm supposed to worry about trips. I'm supposed to do retreats. I'm so two hundred thousand dollars. You can't listen. <laughs> and then every year the teachers get a raise and they'll say, oh, we'll give we'll give you three percent increase three percent isn't enough for no. the raise no you understand what i'm saying so every time the teachers keep going up our salaries keep going up and our there's less money so when teachers are like schools don't try y'all are not arguing and advocating to the elected officials to say we need more monies in our schools because this is what it looks like. The elected officials don't even know the formula of what schools look. They don't know. The school system knows. And half of the time, let me be clear, your school doesn't even get the full amount of money that the state allocates. 
Because as long as you have central offices, you don't get all the money. Mm. Right? So in mm. New York, I'm putting y'all on to game. In New sure. York, it costs $12,000. They give us twelve five. The state allocates $12,500 per general ed child. Special right. ed children is $22,000 per child. Okay? But by the time the school gets the budget, we get $4,500 general ed child and then $9,800 special ed child. I told y'all 22,000 is supposed to be special ed. We get $9,800. Then they throw us a little bone and they say, oh, your kids are high poverty. So we're going to give you $2,000 for that. And then your kids are low proficiency. So we're going to give you $1,500. Y'all not giving me nothing. I was supposed to have 22 from the door. Right. <laughs> so now you're giving me 13,000, maybe from the 22,000. So where's the other money going to? The central office people, the ones who's creating policies that's crazy. Wow. The ones who's sitting here, pre all these mandates, directive this, directive that, this per all of these people get paid before the school gets paid. So that's why I don't engage in arguments about charter school versus public schools. Cause you know what the charter schools do? They get the full amount of the money. Because it's only them. It's the charter school and their director of finance and their director of um, academics and HR. They keep it within house. Wow. And, and you know what? Just over the past 20, 25 minutes, you've mentioned FMLA. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned low teacher pay, mm -hmm. which should be given for all of us who's, who's in this profession. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the allocation, or in some cases, the misallocation of school funds. Mm -hmm. All this goes back to legislation. Yep. Which is why now, you know, we have a new administration coming in, new Secretary of Ed. Right. We have to say some things at the federal level, but more importantly, we have to do it at the state level, at our it's local level. Level. The, let's be talk. clear. Let's right. be clear. It's not about the feds, right? The feds do no. have responsibilities, but you need right. to understand that the feds give money with guidelines. So you got to know all your title, title one money, mm -hmm. title nine and 10. Like there's titles and there's a reason why there's these titles that race to the top. You know, Obama did that. That that hurt us. That wasn't helpful. No child left behind. You got to understand those things hurt us because people, they have good intentions. We want to give money to schools that are struggling. But you know what happens? They allocate millions of dollars that go into schools. Right. So let's say a school gets fifty thousand to one hundred thousand dollars in federal funding. It is the big companies that have contracts with the school system that get that money. So when I was teaching and we had, um, we had uh, the, the No Child Left Behind, Kaplan, Sylvan were the top two that was in our schools selling us all this stuff. So we had these big thick Kaplan books. Y'all know they good for SATs and ACT. They didn't care. This is what's going to get kids to pass the test. It wasn't about get kids to learn to love reading, get kids to have phonetic awareness, get kids to have comprehension skills. Nope. It was like, give them this big, thick book and teach them how to answer these questions. That's what it looked like. But you couldn't say no because your money was tied to getting this company that had to come in to your school to prove that you were doing that work. And so... If you're in this field, you see how I go hard for it? It's because I love and I'm passionate about it. We got to get educated on the industry we're in. We become so tunnel vision and we get to a place of ignorance. 
And I don't say it in a disrespectful way. When I say ignorance, it's our lack of knowledge and understanding. Because we've been beat down so much, we only focus on, I got to get through the content. I got to get through the school day. I got to get through the school year. And so when June or May hits, you are checked out. You want your vacation. You want your time back. You're not reading articles about what's happening in education. You're not going to conferences to find out about the new technologies. You're not engaging in relationships and building and understanding from other people about what the education council in your local state is actually talking about and what their intentions are. We are told what we have to do every single time. And then when we hear what we have to do, we get upset. But what do you know about your profession beyond your classroom? Come and on, so I, I'm, 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 I'm stressing this because we got to get armed with information. So when I'm meeting with an elected official, whether it's on the local side of things or it's on the federal side of things, I'm often one of few people who can go toe to toe with them and tell them what I know. Cause they'll be like, wow, <laughs> like you're very passionate. They, and they don't know. They have no idea. I remember it was John King. I was with John King um, and Dr. King um, and, um, and Stephen Perry, he's the you know principal, the, yeah, charter, the school. charter school, but of uh, Capital Prep. Capital, yeah. And I remember it. We were at Essence Fest, and he, I know John because the leadership program that I went through, he actually was one of the um, facilitators. Like he taught us how to like hire people, like how you get people on the bus and get them off the bus. And sure. so we maintained this relationship because he became then um, commissioner of New York State. And so I remember going back and forth with John, um, Stephen Perry, like, Dr. Perry, I don't get $22,000 per kid. He was like, yo, you get like $12,000. And we were going back. I said, I don't get $12,000. Dr. King had to be like, she doesn't get what you get. You're a charter school. She gets something totally different. And he was like, what? He was like, girl, you, gotta, you need to leave you need to leave the, you know, and come on over to charter schools. And I kind of felt like, but I don't want to, like, I got to fight and make sure that they know that I know that we're not getting all this money. Yes. Right. And when I told the director of finance, how much money we get, he was like, where are you getting this information from? I said, I spoke to the commissioner of education for New York state. I said, it's cool. You can Google it. So I Googled it and I sent it to him in an email and then he called me back. He was like, I apologize, blah, blah. He was like, I didn't even, I didn't even know that. I said, mm -hmm. because there's people on top of him that where that money goes to. So we just, we really got to get smart. It, you can't talk about how oppressive the system is if you don't even understand the complexity of the system, right? right. And you got to understand how you have to hold people accountable. So when the question is, what made you stay so long? It's because it's a setup. It is a setup. It wasn't enough about how much money I was making or how much time, because I didn't take vacation. It was, if I don't do this work, I got generations that's going to be impacted by what I do today. That's what it came down to. It came down to someone worked for $26,000 when I was a kid and showed up every day and probably was complaining that they needed more money. But because of their work, I became a principal so that I can make sure the kids who are in front of me have a better future. And so we have to remember that. And so they're not going to respect us if we don't even know how to argue or debate why we deserve more and how they're shortchanging us. So when the feds give more money, understand they're going to give more money, but it's going to be tied to something that's going to be maybe assessment driven, maybe portfolio driven, because you're not going to get money without showing us some type of growth. There has sure. to be a measurement of standard. Just it's, it's just part of the nature of the game, right? Yes, it is. So when the feds give the money, that's one thing, but you also have to say, what is the local level expecting of you? 
they're the ones who have the greatest impact of your day-to-day -day function. Yes, they do. <laughs> Between your superintendent, your governor, and your council members, your congressman, they all, so you need to go and just find out who's on who who's the school board, find out what's with the school board when they're meeting, when they're having their virtual meetings. And I keep telling people, y'all ain't gotta go to every single one. Don't go to every single one. But you have to start getting aware because when you start sitting in on those meetings and you'll be like, oh, this is what they voting on. They don't even have no educators in here because y'all not showing up. Because you know why? You're tired. I already worked seven to three. I don't want to go. I'm exhausted. OK, the people making decisions are not tired enough to hear anything you have to say. They're not concerned about you. Wow. They got time. And, and they're not all, in the classroom. This is all by design. It's it all by design. And full transparency, I was one of those teachers who got caught up in a romanticization of being a teacher. Oh, I'm going to impact kids. Oh, I'm going to save the world. You know, all, all that stuff that they want to put out there, the cosmetic stuff. And I still love having an impact on kids. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. I love this job. I love this work. I mean, it's my passion. But as I've gotten older and gained experience and and gotten game just through my experiences, I realized, you know what? They really treat a lot, they they train us as slaves, like real talk. And when you think about just everything, we talked about FMLA, we talked about low teacher pay, we talked about the allocation of funds. How about if you work at a Title I school? The fact that you gotta work five years consecutively at a Title I school just to get $17,500 forgiven out of your loans? Not all of your loans, just $17,500. So mm -hmm. what if you're that teacher that took out private loans like a Sally Mae? Mm -hmm. 17500 is not going to do anything to create a dent <laughs> in those loans. But yet, we're conditioned to think we have to fight through those five years. We can't have no breaks because here's the thing: if there's a break, we don't get that money. That's the part that they don't they don't they don't tell us. You gotta be there five consecutive years. I'm sorry. But go they, ahead. They they just started that right. So when I was teaching, we didn't get loan forgivenesses like that. We didn't right. get the loan forgiveness. And then when they did give out the loan forgiveness, they said because I'm an administrator, I'm not eligible. And I was like, That's crazy. Wow. Do you understand? I didn't pay off my loans until two years ago. Two years ago. And at that point, I had to just write a check because I was like, yo, this like you mess around and don't pay one month the way they harass you and add the thing on. And I was like, Dick, like, come on, yeah. stop. Hold on. Right. And my daughter was going to college. I was like, yo, I can't I cannot still have student loans and she's going to college and mess around and have to take out a loan for her and be paying on top of that. I was like, no, I can't, I can't. Mm -mm. no, I'm not doing this. So right. I ended up paying off my student loans two years ago. And the student loans isn't even from my graduate degree. It was from my undergraduate degree, which I got a nursing degree. I'm not even practicing nursing. Do you understand? So I was just like, yo, this is so super whack. <laughs> this is whack. So when folks are like, you know, it, it, you just have to understand that when I say we have to redefine what education is like, we have to do it as a collective, right? Yes. I see everyone you know, there, there are a lot of us who are now in a position of being online and, and having platforms and sharing information. And that's so important. But as I shared, when I was on, um, black girls teach, I said, what's not, what's not going to be helpful is somewhere along the line, inadvertently, we create clicks, right? So it becomes the groups you start to see a certain group emerge. They all rocking together. They become the leaders of the pack. Everybody wants to follow them. People start emulating them. They become the, the higher echelon. And it's like, okay, it's inevitable that someone is going to have to emerge as leaders. 
right? And understanding that we have to know what the fight is, right? So what's our ask? Ultimately, what's your ask going to be? And, and when I say that, it's like, if teachers are like teachers are literally working in in schools where they're being abused. Right. Literally. They're being abused every single day. Right? And then they the same teachers want there's some people who are being abused. There's some people, I'm just going to say it, y'all ain't worth a damn. Some of y'all. I'm not saying everybody, but there's some folks who literally show up, don't know their content, don't know how to put together a lesson plan don't want to take support and assistance, know all things, want to challenge, and then we'll get on social media and act like they are the ever loving educator. And I'm like, wow, come on, you are not serious. Right? Like, and no, and here's the thing, half of the times folks are not checking for receipts. So how do I know that you are who you are? You know what I'm saying? Like, I take that to heart. I don't talk about myself per se. I love talking about my scholars. I love talking about what the team was able to do. I love talking about, you know, the work and and having people be thoughtful about what it looks like and what we can do to change it, right? But if you had to ask somebody, there's going to be some teachers who'd be like, yo, she... Some folks felt like I was too hard. They felt like I had too much expectations. But if you ask them, but did she did she sit with you though? Did she come like did she, she says she would sit with teachers after school and she would pay y'all to come on Saturdays to do work and she offered you Saturday programmings and during the summer and they would probably they would have to say she did do those things. She sure did. I read the book. You did those right? things. You did those things. <laughs> you don't, you gonna respect me. You ain't gotta like me. And because if you don't like me, you don't gotta stay here. I used to have this meeting all the time. This is not a plantation. I just want y'all to be very clear. You are not forced to stay here. So mm. whenever you feel ready to start working on your resume and transitioning out, please do that. But just trust and believe you may not want a recommendation from me. Don't put me as a reference if you know there was no way that you showed up for these children and you tried to challenge me and you didn't add any value. Don't do it. My team will tell you, anybody who came through my building will be like, no, she did say that. Because you are not going to sit here and ask somebody to call me. I can't yeah. say nothing bad about you, but you're not going to put me in a position where I have to be like, um, it's just not a good fit. Right. If folks who know me, if you hear it's not a good fit, you don't have anything else to see? No. Yeah. And and this is something, and you're touching on this idea of just teacher activism, because this is something that I've been very vocal about um, in recent weeks, and, and really for a while, just the idea that I feel like when you look at, for instance, Instagram, you can tell who the real ones are, right? Mm -hmm. You can tell which people are actually about that work and are using their platforms in a way that is going to create impact in their communities and beyond, mm -hmm. right? And there's some who they just want to appropriate the hashtags and they want to sell you TPT stuff. And it's like, listen, if that's what you want to do, like, I get it. We got to, you got to monetize however you need to as educators. I get it. But at the same time, don't appropriate the movement, right? Don't do that because then it makes all of us look bad. And then you mentioned the fact that there's this elitism that happens, you mm -hmm. know, with the ranks where people tend to gravitate towards certain people mm -hmm. and they look at them as, you know, as like gods and goddesses, as opposed to, all right, as a collective with right. our intellectual property, right. with what we all can bring to the table within our capacities we can really push for some change. And that's the part that I loved about um, Teachers for Good Trouble. Mm -hmm. um, it was the fact that they had a clear goal, which mm -hmm. was to end standardized testing during COVID-19 because of the obvious um, health issues that are associated with it and how it was impacting teachers, how teachers were dying from it, how students were dying from it, even school administrators were dying from it. Mm -hmm. So, that was a collective of individuals. And for some of them, some of them weren't even that active on social media, but guess what? They played a role in that movement. 
They weren't. Mm-hmm. It wasn't all people that had twenty thousand followers. Mm-hmm. It wasn't all people that had you know the swipe up and all the other features. These were just people who simply cared about education and simply cared about scholars and mm-hmm. making this profession better. And that's what allowed it to be uh, what it was. And if we all took a page from from that movement and what it was able to do within the within the span of a month mm-hmm. and it's still building, imagine how much progress we can make just as a whole. And this is something that I'm actually going to be talking about um, in Clubhouse in a couple weeks, just exploring what educator activism, activism looks like, what should it sound like, what should it look like, when do we call out folks, when do we call in folks? Right. Because I do believe in calling in, especially if it's somebody with good intentions and wants to do the work the right way in a way that's not um, performative uh, by right. any means. So, but that's another conversation for another day. That because there's is. so much to unpack with that. But fan, but I will also push to say um, that movement is important, right? Because it starts to say to people like. Teachers are saying, yo, that's not what we're doing. Like we right. need to start standing up and saying what's what's unjust and unfair. Um, but I want to push people to also consider you can't do this work alone, right? So no. they don't listen. They not li- they're not gonna listen to you before they listen to a parent. You understand? Because regardless of work as a as a teacher, you're you know, when, when, when teachers are like, I'm barely making enough money, but you're still coming back to work. It's, it doesn't matter if it's education, every job, every corporation, every system, they do things. If you study HR, if you ever taken an HR course, they literally show you how people are trapped into their positions. They incentivize in a way, they build in things in a way that you are so consumed by that work that you don't even think about anything else. Right. And so you don't grow. You don't seek anything that would be up of, of value to your own personal abilities to expand who you are in terms of your knowledge or skill set. Right. And so. Every teacher who's frustrated because of the pandemic. At least 75, 25 percent might say I'm out of here, but 75 percent are going to still stay. Yes. Because the first thing they say is, well, where else am I going to go? What am I going to do? What am I going to do else? What else am I going to do? Right. right. And I'm not saying for everybody to leave the workforce, because if we left the workforce, then there would be no one else left for these, for our children to have in terms of people who care in the classrooms. But you are, you have become by law caregivers to children. Right. And I need people to be very clear and, and elected officials as well. When we, they say caregivers, we become the parents of children when they are in our care. We don't become babysitters, we become parents, right? So as a parent, you need to speak to the parents and tell them the ill effects of the children being exposed to taking an assessment during this time. Because the parents are the taxpayers. The parents are their true guardians. You need them to speak on your behalf as well. Because they're the ones who lean on the elected official because nine times out of 10, the community you're working in, you often don't even live in. So right. the, 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 the council person, the senator, the whoever, they ain't worry about you as a teacher because you live in the burbs while you teaching in the inner city. But that parent who's there, the parent who's the uproar, your parent who's about it, about it. You got to whisper something in their ear. You got to, hey, let's go to this meeting together. You, you, It's unfortunate that we have to do all this work, but you got to do all of this work. No, not, you know, we hope we hope that with Dr. Biden being in the in the seat that she is, she will bring light to our profession she will change what it looks like for us to be respected, right? And to get our due um, acknowledgement and recognition for the work that we do. But we cannot uh, 
be dependent on anyone to save us. Because if this administration, if they don't get another four years after this and we get someone else, it will revert back to whatever it was. So that's why you have to make sure that you're creating the movement now. And when people know that alongside teachers, there are parents, parents don't always show up, but you got to start educating them. Or yeah. as a collective, you got to start developing relationships with the elected officials. It's unfortunate for me to say this, but I, you know, during the COVID, I was like, y'all got to learn about the word PACs. You really do. Your money is how elected officials move. They move where the money's at. So if you imagine if you got 10 teachers or 15 teachers and every pay period y'all put together $5, $5, that's $10 times 15 people, that's $150. And every single month y'all did that. So for 12 months and then for the next four years, whatever that amount is, if your goal is we're going to have a thousand, we're going to have 2000, we're going to have $3,000. You go to an elected official and you be like, so we got $4,000. We're going to write this check or you write 500, 500, 500. They start paying attention. Where does $500 come from? Oh, there's a teacher pack that they have. Well, let me meet with them. Yeah. See, um, my in-laws, cause my mm -hmm. wife, she's, uh, her father's from Barbados and, um, her mom's from Panama. Mm -hmm. So see, they call it Susu. Yeah. So that's, that's a Susu basically. Hey, everybody pitching some money. So this is something that's embedded in the culture, you know, Caribbean culture, just, and that's how you grow the money. But you're all this you're saying, these are things that a lot of us don't catch on to until later on in our careers. We're not taught this mm -hmm. in our teacher education programs. Like, honestly, the minute that I went on leave, you know, during the birth of my son, so I used my FMLA, like I was out for three months. And I used up all of my personal and sick days because I never took days off. That's mm -hmm. how much time I had. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't the case where they gave me like the days, like I used up my own days to take three months off to be with my newborn son. Mm -hmm. so when you talk about FLA, like I know all about that. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's crazy is it wasn't until maybe my last year in the classroom or second to last year where I started to, you know, build my consulting company. And it wasn't even a consulting company then. Like it started off with like my book. Mm -hmm. Like I wrote this book and I started to share with my, my colleagues. They're my first customers. And they're like, yo, Kwame, this book is dope. Like you, you're saying some good stuff. Mm -hmm. But guess who didn't buy the book? My administrators. Mm -hmm. They were the ones hating on me. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not saying anything bad about them. I'm not talking greasy about them. I'm just telling them about just my early experiences, because I feel like if I share my story, it's going to help some other novice teachers or teachers coming in from practicum and from these other programs who are going into this um, field. So I'm just trying to share game, just like you're sharing game right now. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing to see who your real investors are, who your real supporters are. And, and then, and then just thinking about just the idea of monetizing on your talents. Think about the way our school systems are structured especially in public schools, like you have, we all have different um, steps you, you, you go through for your salary. Mm -hmm. All right. Every year, you know, I, I taught in Boston, so they were good for that. Right. Had a mm -hmm. strong union. So they make sure that we got paid, but you had to get, you know, your 1%, 2% every year, you're growing incrementally. And then your school district tells you, okay, in order for you to expedite that process, you need to take some postgraduate courses. Mm -hmm. You need to, you know, go back and get a master's, or better yet, go get you a doctorate. That way, you can get your master's plus fifteen, master's plus thirty, master's plus seventy-five. So you're busting your behind trying to get to the top, the mountain top. And then let's say that you want to go to a new school. You got principals and other leaders saying, you know what? Damn, we can't even afford you. Mm -hmm. But 
but I've been incentivized for 15, 20 years doing what y'all told me to do. Y'all told me to go back to school, get my degrees. Y'all told me to invest in extra courses to improve my craft. I do what you asked me to do. I'm at 20 years. I'm getting paid. I'm pretty much at the ceiling. Mm-hmm. And y'all gonna tell me that I can't even get another job based on my credentials and qualifications. That That's the trap right there that they don't tell you about. So, and I think it's something that people have to understand when they go into, really, when they go into any kind of school setting, particularly a school district. Mm-hmm. Because that's pretty much what generally happens. So, you have to play the long game. Like you have to under, you have to know how long you're going to be there and when you're going to step out and say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and just take what I know, my intellectual property, right? So like you see all these TPT people, all they, they're just using up archive lesson plans and then beautifying it up to sell. They're repurposing content. Yeah. And that's how they get in money. Yeah. If we had, if we were hip to that game before we got in, we wouldn't be hearing all this commiserating about pay because we know this stuff, as you mentioned. But Well, it's like with anything else. Um, why aren't our kids taught financial literacy in school? Right. right? Why aren't they taught about their history in school? Why aren't they? Why, why aren't we preparing them really for the soft skills that they'll need in order to navigate in any type of industry? Because that doesn't fit into the box, right? Teaching you how to liberate yourself gives you choices. And if they give you choices, that means you're free. And if you're free, that means we can't have shackles on you. So it does not interest them to teach and prepare you, even though if I taught and prepared you, you would more like most likely stay at the site because you know how to fish for yourself, right? As opposed to me giving you the fish to eat. But what happens is they would rather, some school, some places just don't know. They don't even think about it. They, they're just so focused on, this is what we've been doing. We're not gonna change it. And then right. there's some places who are like, you know what, we need to ensure that educators are getting what they need, a well-rounded, um, education. So there may be small schools in between in terms of say, small schools, a small number of schools that actually take that time. But that needs to happen. Like there needs to be preparation. But as educators, you can't just, I honestly, it, it hurts. It hurts me because I think that I will work has so much implications on future lives. Yes. We're the ones that ha- are the foundation for every other career. We're the ones who literally, um, <laughs> we set the tone. We put the battery in the children's back. We, we can make or break a kid, literally. We can make or break children because if we pour into them, they will love learning. And if we sit there and exile them and we treat them less than, they don't, they, they don't do well in school, right? And children remember the people who did not treat them well while they were in school. But because you feel like you're so, you, you've been beat down so much and you're not even acknowledged, it's a lot. No one says thank you, right? Like for some people, they can make a small amount of money, but because someone thanks them, because someone gives them like some type of recognition, uh, 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 you know, there are people who literally, let's say a home health aid, right? A home mm-hmm. health aid doesn't make a lot of money, but they develop relationships with the with the with their patients. The family regards them and and trusts them and 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 may give them like acknowledgement, extra pay, gifts, whatever they would stay with that family not making a lot just because of the relationships that they have. Absolutely. And the problem is, is that in our profession, sometimes we don't even have an established relationship with the people that are the supervisors in our building. We become a number. We just become cogs in a wheel. We just become the thing like no one cares about you. No one's asking how you're doing. No one's asking about your family. Your colleagues are really the ones who hold you together, but because your colleagues may be disgruntled, y'all are all disgruntled. So it just becomes negativity, negativity, negativity. And so 
we don't have a way out. And then when we we actually have to get schooled on stuff, we get a we get offended and or embarrassed. So if someone taught us about financial literacy because we have eight years into our profession and we should have known about insurance policies and we should have known about savings and we should have known about stocks and we should we actually get turned off because we don't want to be able to say I didn't know that because we're supposed to be the educators. Right. So sometimes it just requires like wherever you're at, wherever you are at. Be willing to learn. Listen, I've always known about stocks. I've always known about stocks. I didn't start investing and really paying attention and doing all the things until last year I started doing my work. And then I started investing in stocks. I could have been investing in stocks 25 years ago. Now, don't get me wrong. I've had mutual funds. I have all type of stuff. But in terms of the actual stock game. Right. Now, did I feel a little embarrassed? Like, yo, how many people are making I mean, who, amount of money? Be a bit, right? <laughs> you know, like it's all of these things. I started feeling inadequate. Like, how old am I? I got a, ch- a kid in college. She's, she's, you know, legal age practically. And I'm sitting here and now I'm learning something. But then at the same time, I was like, I'm, it's best to start somewhere. There's people who became millionaires at the age of 45, 50 years old, and they just stuck with it. So I'm not going to sit here and be embarrassed or ashamed. Look, I mean, Ava DuVernay didn't start really making films until her early to mid 30s. And that's and that's a fact. And look at where she is now. You just have to stick with it. And so right. if people just like from this conversation, I know we went all around the mulberry bush, Listen, right? It's all and it good. Was, it, was, it was worth the conversation. I just want folks to know like you are more than enough, but you need to be taught how much you are worth, right? And we need to we need to know how and when I say taught to, taught what we're worth is that we have to start owning and knowing who we are and the value we possess. And we have to be okay with being willing to learn about the things we don't know and start asking the right questions, right? We will teach children to ask questions and there are no dumb questions, but then when we, it's our time, we won't ask questions. We will teach children to open up their mouths and speak, and even if they're wrong, we'll talk them through where they went wrong. But then when it comes to us, we wanna be perfect. Right. And so we have to sometimes just become the young scholar in the classroom and be willing to learn, don't matter how old you are. And just know that this is an amazing profession, but I'm gonna call on my leaders. You have to respect and 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 appreciate the people who come into your building every single day, even when you're not being appreciated. Because I'm gonna speak from from my own experience. I wasn't always valued and appreciated as a principal. I went through four superintendents, four before I resigned. Do you understand? So in 10 years to have four different people, they all came with their own personas, their expectations. And there was one who really was like rock solid. And then there were others who I was like, and I just had to follow the letter of the law, right? And so if I treated my team the way they treated me, oh, you know, they would be like, I hate that school (laughs) straight up because that's what it was. But I was willing to show up and do for my team what wasn't being done for me. And so I need leaders to know that your job, as much as it's about compliance and meeting the bottom line of the numbers, you also have a response humanizing the experiences for your team. But on the flip side, I'm going to say to the staff, It's important for you to acknowledge and honor your leaders. They are not perfect. They have a lot on their plate. And if you find yourself working for someone who doesn't value you, you have to make an executive decision and not stay somewhere you feel like you're being abused. Because it makes no sense. You're proving nothing by staying somewhere that you're not happy, only to be there to complain every single day, every single year, taking up space. Get your resume together and move on. 
And you can't right. say it's about the kids because guess what? The kids end up graduating. So what is it really about? They not staying with you forever. They're going to move on. So move on. You, you wow. still love what you do. Stay in communication. If you really about those relationships with kids, don't you have their home phone numbers? Don't you have their parent contact information? It's not about them. Stop being complacent or being complicit to a system that's treating you bad and then you start treating the kids bad. So we wow. all have a responsibility to show up differently and to, and, and to really start pushing the needle because there's too many people in our profession who don't care. There's too many people in our profession who are not educated on our profession. And so because there's so much going on, guess what? The powers that be decide they're going to treat us all the same and have no regard for us, even though we're giving our best. So we got to demand and ask for different, but we got to show up differently as well. Wow. And, and this is officially the longest <laughs> episode in I Dane Talk for Educate's Life History. But guess what? Every single minute has been worth it. Uh, usually I would do a lightning round, but I'm like, you know what? This is so much more important <laughs> than this lightning round. So here's what I want you to do before we wrap up. I want you to talk about the rec room because uh -huh. this is really the main reason why I wanted you to come on because we have a lot of teachers and a lot of administrators who are struggling and the struggles didn't start during COVID. This is like pre-COVID, but as you mentioned, there's a cumulative effect that happens when we mm -hmm. talk about trauma and, and just all the different responsibilities that we have to juggle. So if you could just talk to us about the rec room and how it's going to serve some of our educators who are struggling to exercise self-care um, at this time. So the rec room is um, a group coaching um, program. It's eight weeks and it's focused on a cohort method, a cohort process. So um, there are up to 10 educators who are in this group who sign up um, and are committed to um, eight weeks of learning essentially. And the focus is providing the strategies for aspiring and current leaders in order to navigate the work, um, <laughs> all, all the things that come with a position of authority in a school. Um, and so alongside of learning frameworks that I have developed that work, that have been proven to work, um, you know, how to really identify the problems in the school and know how to delegate and be able to not be the person that puts out all the fires, but assessing which ways and in which ways we show up for those situations. Um, a but alongside of that, just being reflective in ourselves and how we practice on a day-to-day -day basis. But within that is self-care because what I don't want is for leaders to feel abandoned, demoralized, um, lack of being, um, feeling that anyone cares for who they are and what they need to do in terms of prioritizing themselves. So um, I take them through a process of teaching them how to actually prioritize um, their personal well-beings. We have guest speakers who show up as well um, to give them really great advice. But again, some strategies that they can apply immediately. Um, and then also just the idea of having a cohort because it's very isolating to be a leader. You have to make up every decision. You have to be all things for everyone. And you really don't have quote unquote friends in the building that you can sit down because your subordinates are your subordinates and you have to treat them accordingly, right? We can be cool, but I can't tell you everything that I'm experiencing in leadership. So by having a safe space where you can share your experiences, you can build relationships and have this camaraderie, it allows people to feel like they are seen, heard, and can thrive and not just survive in the position. Yes. And vulnerability is the key we need a space to be vulnerable exactly because every day you're transparent but that vulnerability is this is a space where you can cry you can be angry you can do all the things you can say all the things but once we do that it's okay what are the solutions because it's a solution driven group 
Um, so if people are interested, um, they can definitely follow my Instagram account at the Lopez effect is actually, um, I have a link tree link, um, and you can, um, sign up. There's an informational that's going to be happening next week, Tuesday at seven o'clock, but the next rec room is happening Thursday. So we're having our last informational for folks who are like, Oh, I missed the other two. <laughs> Okay, we have a one last one, um, but the seats are quickly filling up. So if folks are interested, please join me for the informational or you can book a call that's actually on the link tree as well to learn more and to talk about what your needs are um, so that maybe there's another coaching program that I have available that can best meet your needs. Awesome. And I'll make sure that we provide information um, when we post the clip on Instagram. Okay. But but wow, uh, Dr. Lopez, thank you. You're welcome. I'm I'm full. <laughs> Good. Um, and I think this is something that hopefully aspiring teachers listen to, and they're able to draw inspiration from because this is not something that they're going to be learning in their education programs. You know, they're not going to learn this, so. Better to get it from someone that's been through it than to get it from a professor who has no idea what it's like. Exactly. To do exactly. this. So I I appreciate you. And once again, it's an honor to have you on this platform. Well, thank you for the invitation, Kwame. And and you know, I'm here in support of the work that you do. So I look forward to how we can build in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you again and hope you have a good night. You too. All right. Thank you. And there we have it, folks. The longest running episode of I Didn't Talk Educators Live History. And I hope that you listen to every single minute of it because this could ultimately change your life, change your trajectory in the field of education. I'm just so full. I'm just so full. I have nothing else to say. So all I'm going to say is this. Until next time, people. I wish you all a good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Uh, peace out, everybody.